Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, thank you for coming. We are delighted today, of course, to have Henry Jenkins, who is Provost Professor of it's a triple appointment, so it's confusing. Communication, Journalism, and Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California. And we're delighted to have him here with us all semester. He's been working on a new book, and he's going to talk to us about it today. Thanks. Thank you very much for turning out. Um, I will, I will fall into the usual trap of saying this is a work in progress. This is a work barely in progress. I've been starting with this book project since the time that I arrived here in September, and this is intended as a kind of first public presentation or overview of what some of the thing, ideas that will animate the project. Um, it, the title, Comic and Comics and Stuff, started with is a kind of joke. Uh, the phrase, and stuff, usually withering off, is often used to refer to et cetera, assorted things. Uh, when we get vague and vague in our conversation, we use that phrase, and stuff. But as I've gotten deeper into the project, it's taken on a life of its own. And as I will explain later, stuff really is a technical term here, and one that grows out of a serious scholarly literature that I'm, going, that I'm trying to engage, engage with. I'm going to try to remember to, to designate what the pictures are from. This is from artwork by Seth for one of the Mr. X comics uh, that Dean Motter produced in the 90s. And part of what interests me about that image is Seth, who's an, an extraordinary collector and connoisseur of mid-century modern stuff, uh, and sort of has depicted here a variety of objects, some real, some imagined that reflect his design sensibility and, in, and brought them in as background detail in this panel. But the background detail in some way overwhelms the panel itself. It becomes the source of its own fascination. And that's part of what intrigued me as going into this project. So this pro paper presentation has three parts. The first is on comics. The second is on stuff. And the third part, predictably enough, is on comics and stuff. So I'm going to begin by thinking a little bit of what's happening in comics at the current moment. And I begin with a quote from Art Spiegelman, who was speaking at a panel at the University of Chicago with W.T. Mitchell, who was one of the most prestigious art historian's critics. It's a discussion that ends up in the literary journal Critical Inquiry. And all of that seems to be signpost of the fact that this is a conversation about how comics gained a certain kind of cultural prestige. And so Spiegelman says, in the 1970s, I was reading Marshall McLuhan, another marker of intellectual pedigree. He pointed out that when something is no longer a mass medium, it has to become art or it dies. And I was realizing comics, even in the 1970s, were beginning to wane from their glory years when they were truly a mass, mass medium. And I thought of it very literally as a, literally as a Faustian deal that had to be made with the culture. And it was a fraught one and a dangerous one. I figured it was necessary for comics to find their ways into libraries, bookstores, universities, and museums, because otherwise there wouldn't be an apparatus that could sustain what had been sustained by Sunday newspapers and pamphlet comics and things like that in the latter part of the century. So to understand his comment, we sort of need to do a quick and dirty, broad sketch history of comics as a medium. So what we see here are two of the, press, the most acclaimed comic artists of the American newspapers at the turn of the last century, in the early 1900s. That's Altcult, the Yellow Kid. That's Windsor McKay, uh, uh, Little Nemo, and, and Dreamland. Uh, yeah? What's an example of a mass medium that failed to, became art, that failed to become art and hence died? I say I, I disagree with McLuhan on that in the sense that there are no dead medium. There are dead delivery technologies. But I think you could say vaudeville was one of those forms that they got absorbed into film and television and persist 
today in something like Saturday Night Live, but as a theatrical presentation form, it ceases to exist. Right now it's coming back. There's new vaudeville on Broadway and so forth precisely as an art form. So we can sort of argue that it went away and then came back only resurrected as an art form. Or burlesque and the new burlesque would fit into a similar category where suddenly self-aware burlesque shows are emerging as a campus phenomenon that reflects uh, a return to a lost form. But McLuhan and uh, Bruce Sterling and others talk about dead media. I tend in my work to think about continuities, persistence, but that's the essence of what McLuhan is arguing. All right, so we see here two very different aesthetics. And this is because at the time, the comic artist owned their page. They could do whatever they wanted within the page. Altcult uses large images that have to be scanned extensively and read over time. McKay begins to break down the panel into frames. Uh, but those are two possibilities available to comics in an early time. By the late 20s, comics have become widespread across American newspapers. They become more standardized through syndication. The shift from artistic control to a formula or format that can play out in newspapers across the country, can be mixed and matched in a variety of ways, has shaped the medium. And comics begin, comic strips begin to emerge as printed monthly magazines, initially as inserts in newspapers that simply reprinted earlier comic strips, later as a standalone print form treated like a magazine, often published by the same people who are publishing pulp magazines in the United States, hence a bleeding over of genres between the two. And the first real killer app of the comic is Superman, right? So the superhero becomes the killer app that makes standalone comic material, original comic material, something that's commercially viable. At its peak in the late 30s, early 40s, pretty much every kid in America reads comics, male and female. Something like 98% of boys, 97% of girls. It's really remarkably high, the percentage of people who are reading it. That group rose older during World War II as GIs are taking comics because they're lightweight and portable on the battlefield in their knapsacks. And so they become, a, a, the people who grew up reading comics in the 30s become sort of adult readers of comics. And when they return, there's generally an expectation that the content of comics will mature with them, that it will be open to explore a variety of other concerns. Here we see the notorious crime comics or horror comics that DC is publishing during this period. And anytime you see a shift in the status of media, what you frequently see is also a backlash because people's mental perception isn't consistent with the expanding marketplace. So I would argue that what happened with Frederick Wortham and the comics panel panics of the 1950s was a moment where comics were appealing to adults. They were still perceived as a children's medium. The result is people were upset that, things, that these, this content was aimed at kids. And the result in this case was, was a moral panic followed by self-regulation, a crackdown that restricted what comics could do to basically only the things that kids could read. So it was a kind of moment of enormous potential followed by a period of stagnation or constraint. Ironically, what happens next is comics get removed from the space where kids go. Because of the increased price of paper and ink and shipping, it no longer became a commodity kids could buy with their allowance became something that was more priced like a magazine. Drugstores are phasing out magazine racks because it's not financially viable for them. The good news was that it got picked up by specialty shops that became spaces where we could reliably subscribe to comics, get comics that we wanted when we wanted. But the result of that was kids, no one encounters comics today unless they're actively seeking them out, right? So you've got to go to a specialty shop, often in a dink, dank, dark basement with a guy with a butt crack, you know, uh, that, that sort of is the space you go to get your comics and it has a kind of furtive feel to it that's cut off from normal commerce. And so for a period of time, kids are not reading comics. The market is shifting only to adults, but the content is still stagnated by the code and it's going to gradually have to break down to pave the way for that adult readership to get more of what it wants. So for paper and ink, like the only commodities in the world that were increasing in price relative to income during this period? I mean... Presumably not. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it just seems like really odd that that happened. 
over this period because like almost everything else was coming down, including like all agricultural products pretty much. So I, I mean, I, I am not an economist, so I, I trust your expertise on why this might have happened, but as the standard industry explanation was that there was the cost of paper, ink, and shipping that raised, raised the cost of comics to the point that they were no longer 12 cents, they were $2, and that that shifts who can, who can afford to buy them in a pretty fundamental way. But I'm, I, I, I'm taking existing accounts, so you could well be right. So what happens at that point is comics start to become something people speculate in, right? That they buy comics as an investment. Now this strategy only made sense because so many comics had been disposed of previously. They had been a discarded medium, a rubbish medium, made on cheap paper, not an ink that wasn't meant to last, something people threw out. So every mom who threw away their kids' comics made the people who kept theirs more, more wealthy. Right, this became a valuable collector. And the minute the word got out that this was a collectible phenomenon, though, comics weren't being thrown away. Comics were being produced just to be collected. And the result was, in fact, the bottom falls out of the collector market. And that's the moment in the late 70s, early 80s, that Spiegelman is referring to in that quote. That is, it's gone through the cycle of mass media, ever narrower medium. It's the, the economic legs are falling out. How will comics survive? What's happened in parallel to that has been the development of alternate circuits and groups of artists who are producing comics. The underground comics, the 1960s, aren't going through comic shops. They're going through head shops. They're, going, they're printed by poster printers. They're self-published by the artist. They're part of the rock, si rock and roll culture and the drug culture of the 60s and 70s. But they, they have a different status. They're not regulated by the same industry structures. They're not bought by the same people, but they're in a period of experimentation with what the form of comics could do. And that's followed by Spiegelman's entry with Raw, which was a magazine that sort of kept the undergrounds alive into the 80s, brought European artists into translation into the US, and introduced waves of new artists who were experimenting with other themes, other subject matters. And Raw became the place where Spiegelman first publishes Mouse, as a serial, later becomes the graphic novel that many people think of as sort of opening the door for the kind of cultural respectability Spiegelman is talking about. The term before Mouse, though, was Will Eisner's Contract with God, uh, which often is credited with being the first graphic novel. In fact, historically, that's not true either. The term graphic novel goes to the 20s and 30s. But Will Eisner triggers a return to a form that is a book link comic that has a novelistic story dealing with themes of everyday life that doesn't necessarily intend it to be shipped through a comic shop, the graphic novel becomes a form that has a certain kind of cultural status or prestige. Now Spiegelman, rep Spiegelman and the graphic novel represented one path forward from that crisis in the 70s and 80s. Uh, Scott McCloud proposed another one in his 2000 book, Reinventing Comics, which was comics could go digital, right? And he sort of suggests the page is an artifact to print, no more intrinsic to comics than staples or Indian ink. Once released from that box, some will take the form of the box with them, but gradually comics creators will stretch their limbs and start to explore the design opportunities of an infinite canvas. So you imagine the total reconfiguration of comics on the computer in fact, we have seen an explosion of new artists, a whole generation of writers, artists probably as significant in their own way as the underground comics or raw generation were, but most of them still design comics that look like the printed page because there's still a hope often that their work will be commodified as a printed book and sold on a marketplace. So they're looking toward print still as the way forward. But what other things that McLeod is predicting, like the freedom, of new artists enter the market easily, of new kinds of content that isn't beholden to the hardcore fans of the specialty shop, so forth, comes true with the digital publication of comics. The other future is the one represented here by Marvel, which is the comics become simply an IP factory, right? That Marvel's owned by, by Disney, DC is owned by Warners. They are essentially run as research and development wings of the entertainment industry. They try new things cheaply, quickly, see what the audience response is. That content gets adapted to other screens. 
and the other screens is where profit gets made. That in many ways, DC and Marvel comics are lost leaders for the studios that now own the rights to them. Now, if we think about that, that history then tells us there might well be multiple comics industries operating in parallel today. Different platform ways people are accessing this content, and different genres are privileged in each. So this is a chart from Diamond, which follows comics distribution, of the top selling floppy comics, monthly comics, in 2014. And you see a pretty strong picture there. It's DC and Marvel, it's superheroes, and so forth. Uh, Walking Dead's the only thing in 2014 that's not a superhero comic that breaks through. Diamond gives us a different picture if we look at graphic no so-called graphic novels sold in comic shops. So this is September's top 10 selling graphic novels sold in comic shops. Here, more likely, in a comic shop, the graphic novel simply means a set of issues of a serial that have been bound together into a book, a reprinting of the monthly content. But well, we see here interesting things that this in September four Batman books still dominate the charts. We see media tie-ins with Avatar, The Last Airbender, Mad Max is a media tie-in. Uh, for some reason, Walking Dead didn't make to the top ten that month, but typically would be there. And then Saga, Descender, some of these other things represent sort of science fictional content, genre content, but not not realist content, but content that's published by second tier comics publishers who often don't make the top 10 or even the top 50 selling comics, but sell significantly better in bound form. Now we compare that to the New York Times bestseller list of top 10 graphic novels for that same time period. This is again September, a totally different picture emerges, right? Different genres. Uh, the only overlaps are potentially the Mad Max and The Walking Dead, which are media tie-in products. In its own way, Fun Home, because of the Broadway show, is also a media tie-in and probably why it's resurged there. There's Mouse is an evergreen, and Persepolis are kind of evergreen content that remains up, bobs up and down on the charts month by month by month. Five of the pieces there are by Raina Tell, Tell Jim, Jim Meyer, um, who started out doing the Babysitter Club graphic novels, has gone on to do young adult graphic novels, and six of the top, uh, seven of the top selling titles among the top 10 are by women. So this points to the way the diversification of the comics marketplace, this, the diversification of who's creating comics, really gets amplified once we go out of the comic shop and into the bookstore, bookstore circuit, so that there's a different kind of thing taking place in terms of what comics are that I think is the phrase graphic novel fairly accurately represents. Almost none of this content was published serially with the exception of Mad Max and Walking Dead, I guess Mouse originally, but it, all of it was conceived as self-contained graphic novels that could be read beginning to end rather than a chunk of a larger arc. So it's a difference between made a miniseries which has a beginning, middle, and end, and a television series which is ongoing. Part of what happened was comic graphic novels courted librarians, and librarians now are key advocates for graphic novel, which is why Scholastic shows up on the cover of so many of those graphic novels in the top 10. Comics are moving into schools, libraries. This is what's rebuilding young, younger readers of comics, and that's been where the growth has. And much of that young adult content is produced by women, which means, again, diversification of who's producing comics. Now, my book is focused on this, an Anglo-American tradition of comics, which is the story I've just told. It's worth signaling that there are two other cultural configurations of comics in the world, many others, but the two biggest would be the Japanese and the Euro comics, specifically French-Belgian comics. And I'm not talking about them because this history wouldn't apply to them. Right? In the case of Japanese comics, we're talking about a history of um, comics being for all readership, a diverse readership, sold both at newsstands and in specialty shops throughout this period of time. So the idea of the shifting between adult and children, the shifting from mass to niche media doesn't really apply particularly well to Japanese manga. In the case of French comics, Euro comics, there's a cultural prestige that surrounds comics from the very beginning. It's understood as a national cultural treasure. 
you know, there are museums and festivals, and there's arts funding for comics. Its cultural status is never really in crisis in Fran France and Belgium in the way that it is in the US. So in, in both of those cases, it doesn't make sense to talk about them in terms of the forces that I'm describing here. Whereas it does make sense to think of a dialogue that exists between American comics, Canadian comics, British comics, New Zealand and Australian comics, all of which are part of a kind of shared cultural tradition, works written in English, struggling with some of the same market pressures, same genre configurations. So to sum up what I've just said, we can think about a shift that's occurring in over this time period from comics to graphic novels, from comics as a disposable medium to an enduring medium, a medium that's meant to last. And enduring, I mean both in the sense of cult, continued cultural value and the sense of being turned into book-like objects on acid-free paper that's intended to survive as opposed to the floppies that are intended to fall apart after you read them. So floppy to bound book, from specialty shop to bookstore and library, from comics fans to some notion of a reading public of the sort that New York Times bestseller list courts, what just happened? Uh, okay, from trash to art, so there's no shifts in cultural status bound up to that, from a focus on the superhero or the sort of genre entertainment to stories of everyday life, and from a mostly masculine to a greater diversity of readers and producers. All of those trends are sort of shaping what comics mean at the present time. Now as that happens, comics are not just looking forward, but they're also looking backwards. And this is a quote from Bill Worderson, of Calvin and Hobbes in 1989, gave a speech as he was ending that strip, where he says, amazingly, most of the best comic work was done early on in the medium's history. The early cartoonists, with no path before them, produced works of such sophistication, wit, and beauty that increasingly seems to me that cartoon evolution is working backwards. Comic strips are moving toward a primordial goo rather than away from it. Most readers today have never seen the best comics of the past, so they don't even know what they're missing. Not only can comics be more than they were getting today, but comics already have been more than we're getting today. So he's sort of urging comics readers Fan, creators to go back and reclaim their cultural ancestors. And this becomes an important project because while the history of the superhero remained continually in print, much of the earlier experimentation, the diversity of comic stuff from both comic strips and early comic books that didn't fit that paradigm, fell into the, out of print, became unavailable for a period of time. So the comic artist became the advocate for reclaiming that earlier tradition to demonstrate they were part of something larger than just the current moment. So here we see a page from John Matt's Spint, which sort of depicts himself as a comics collector, in this case gathering old panels from Gasoline Alley, which he's bought, on, bought online, is a symbol, cut, has assembled cutouts, is gluing them into, into scrapbooks, and, and sort of building archival preservation of these old comic strips. And it's, in some ways, this is both a demonstration of his street cred as a collector, but it is also a, an act of advocacy. He's telling his readers, Gasoline Alley is a strip you should pay attention to. It's important to understanding how I came to, be, to do the kind of work that I do today. So the next step was Gasoline Alley literally gets reprinted. In this case, Chris Ware is the curator of the Gasoline Alley reprints. It's part of a larger phenomenon of older comics being put back in print, and so part of the explosion of graphic novels right now is an explosion of reprints or curatorial interventions which rescue older works from the past and bring them forward. And that positions the comics artist is someone who's making the hard decisions, what's worth preserving from the past? What do we keep? What do we call? What do we bring forward with us as we reconstruct what comics can be at the current moment? And that dialogue runs through the comics themselves in a variety of ways runs through the discourse around those comics. So Spiegelman ends the quote that I started with with this, it was a Faustian deal because the medium gets tainted by its aspirations toward legitimacy and I was part of that taint. So this is a kind of ambivalence that I think crops up when we think about what's happening. This bid for respectability on the one hand and yet an appeal to the past, the pulp roots, the pop culture roots of comics and, it's, and you see the books themselves trying to reconcile that. So what made Mouse striking was not simply it was telling the story of the Holocaust in graphic form, 
but it was telling it through the language of funny animal comics, right? So it's going back to pop culture to tell a story of serious importance. And the tension between the two, I think, is a tension we see played out in an awful lot of graphic novels as they're bidding for the status of pop culture and cultural respectability at the same time. And that that, so you almost every independent graphic novelist I can think of sooner or later incorporates a superhero in their work. Both to demonstrate they're not doing superhero comics, but to demonstrate their own literacy, their own connection to a larger comics tradition. And we see that tension plays out a lot in contemporary graphic novels. All right, part two, stuff. So this is Kim Deitch in uh, Alias the Cat, draw a picture of his wife Pam and her cats. She collects various black cats uh, from, in various ways. We learn in this novel, novel about her eBay ventures where she goes and tracks down these various collectibles and gradually that becomes the basis of the story in this graphic novel. So as I said, the term stuff is I'm using advisedly as part of a larger trend among cultural anthropologists that are thinking about things, objects, stuff, materiality, material culture, consumer culture, the practices of everyday life. Feeling that these are good tools to think about both what's happening in the comics themselves, comics are stuff, comics are collected, and yet also what they're dealing with on a thematic and visual level. So we can trace some of this back to our Praterize, The Social Life of Things, or Mary Douglas's The World of Goods. Daniel Miller is my guy. I'm really a big fan of his book, Stuff and the Comfort of Things, The Art of Shopping. He's done a number of works just accounting in great detail the everyday life practices of why of people curating stuff, organizing stuff, mapping meaning onto stuff. But it's part of a larger trend, Grant McCracken's Culture and Consumption, um, Ian Hoder's Entangled, and it, from there the anthropological stuff has spilled over into works of art criticism and art production. Orphan Pamuk, the Turkish novelist, has wrote uh, The Museum of Innocence, which is where every chapter is organized around objects that were valued, that are connected to the life of its character, and then in turn built a museum that displays those objects because he was collecting those objects as he was writing the novel. And then he published a catalog, a, a mixture of photographs, text, uh, words and images, in other words, describing the story, mixing real world discussions of developments in Turkish history with the fictional developments of the life of the character. So whether we call that a graphic novel is an interesting question. It's sure ain't comics, but if the term graphic novel refers to complex mixes of words and pictures in, that tells a fiction, one can make a case. This, uh, the Tears of the Things is another art critical piece. Uh, Bill Brown has done a number of things, including a sense of things. Here we see the idea in things. These are literary critics applying this study of things and stuff to thinking about literary text. So we have both art, art history and literature responding to this idea of an anthropology of stuff, trying to understand specifically why stuff becomes meaningful in creative storytelling. So Bill Brown frames his, his book with this set of questions. He wants to explore why and how we use objects to make meaning, to make or remake ourselves, to organize our anxieties and affections, to sublimate our fears and shape our fantasies. And here I have a scene from David Lean's uh, version of Great Expectation, as I always think, of, as I think about 19th century relationships of stuff, to Mrs. Haversham, her stopped clock, her fading wedding dress, her rotting wedding cake, as this kind of obsession with old stuff as both a marker of character and as a marker of time and place. That's sort of part of what people try to explore when they go back to novels. So all that's, most of that stuff on stuff in literature is written in the late 19th century. And what I'm interested in is what's happening with stuff now. So on the one hand, we hear over and over again, things are not made to last. Things are disposable. And we're dealing with the environmental crisis caused by the disposability of much of material culture. We're just overproducing with the expectation that most of what's produced will be discarded, that it's not something that's going to be passed along tomorrow, let alone to the next generation. But at the same time, we're seeing the internet really push forward collector culture. So we're seeing adults hold on to toys that may have once been thought of as disposable later and later into life. And we're seeing this whole genre of people posing for pictures on the internet. 
where their collections sort of representing themselves. And if you think back to the picture of Kim Deesh that I showed, it's very much of the same, same ilk. And that fits into a larger pattern of sentimentalizing stuff, of using stuff to remind us of places we've lived, people we've known, so forth. So stuff becomes part of making meaning of our lives. We're constantly curating our lives. We all face it when we move from one place to the other. What stuff do we hold on to? What do we get rid of? And this valuing of stuff um, becomes a driver of things like eBay. And what I hopefully will bring up now is a commercial for eBay that captures it very well. <laughs> so what if nothing was ever forgotten, what if not, so nothing was ever lost, sort of speaks to this kind of crisis over stuff, memory, return of the lost object. And if we're thinking of comics as playing out that same... Oh, shoot. Uh, of course, YouTube's going to bring more stuff to our collective attention. All right. And it finds just the right video to build off of my ideas, but more distracting than... All right, so we can think of this stuff then as something that's very much in the air that we're trying to make sense of as a culture. And we can see it made sense of in a variety of genres. We're seeing it, Antique Roadshow as a show about what are, what are the old things in your attic might be really valuable, what's in different registers of value and meaning that get attached to it. We're seeing in shows like Hoarders, which is about people who can't let go of stuff, who have insane amounts of stuff all around them. And we're seeing them in kind of a movement of decluttering self-help books um, that are telling people how to get rid of stuff, how to part with things that are important to them. There's a whole secondary industry of used bookstores, curio shops, antique shops, secondhand record shops, vintage clothing stores, all in the business of churning through this stuff. Um, and the result is we end up with homes that look something like this, right? That they're, they're full of clutter, they're full of conflicting symbols of identity, of history, different bids for meaning, all sort of jumbled together. Uh, I don't think this is actually looks like postmodernity, right? The postmodernity idea, this is all surface, in fact, seems wrong to me because I think people are deeply invested in their stuff. They use them to carry memories. They're knowledgeable about stuff. And so thinking of stuff simply as clutter or simply as surface doesn't really get at what's taking place as stuff becomes a central theme that we're trying to explore. Yeah? So this uh, is one image, but there's sort of like an anti-stuff movement as well uh, that's very much part of digital culture. And there's like an ideology of eliminating this stuff, putting it onto you know, some digital form and categorizing and classifying it and so yeah. forth. So the digital, so you're right. First of all, there is a whole, there's a tension between those who are minimalist, who want an anti-materialist declutterers who want to get rid of stuff, and the collectors, the, 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 the curators who want to hold on to stuff that's valuable. So that's a tension. The collect, what it means to be a collector used to be someone who kept things to themselves, and now there's a notion of sharing on, e on on YouTube that's a really important part of collecting. So you demonstrate your value as a collector by making public things that have been lost. And that's a di shift to the digital as well. And Will Straw has a whole essay about the sense of his new configurations of history online that become an important part of how, how we live. So, there, so these things are together. And in some cases, absolutely, you put things online, like you digitize all your records, you get rid of the albums. 
right? That, that these things can work together. That the sharing the material and getting rid of the materiality of it are part, again, in this larger dialogue that's taking place around stuff. So if we want to summarize, stuff is a lifestyle choice, right? To be minimalist, to be a collector, these, to be a hoarder, these are in some sort of continuation of different relations to stuff. There's a shift from inherited objects, which is what really preoccupies 19th century writers, what gets passed from one generation to the next, to the notion of personal selection. The stuff we own is a reflection of us, not of our entire family history or tribal history or national history. And that means there's a whole drama over when someone dies, what other stuff do we keep and what do we get rid of? Right? And that's a central theme running through a lot of the works we're talking about. The idea of moving from possessions to belongings. So the stuff belongs to us, but it also signals what we belong to. And that sense of a belonging is an important concept, I think, right now for thinking about our relation to stuff. This tension between disposability and the collectible. From, and then we can add to that, collectors are not simply who own, people who own stuff. They're people who desire stuff, and they're people who know stuff. So they're configurations of desire and knowledge that take place around stuff, including growing expertise around kinds of stuff that previous generations would have thought of simply as trivial and below attention. Right? So just as comics are reclaiming their past, toy collectors are reclaiming their past, brand people who collect logos from beer cans or whatnot are reclaiming the past. There's a whole exploration, postcard collectors reclaiming their past. That all becomes part of this larger interest. So we can again see comics artist is embedded in this. This film from the Canadian Film Board, Seth's Dominion, is about Seth who is self, self stylized himself as a kind of mid century modern guy. And he describes in the documentary this process of going around taking photographs of Art Deco buildings that are about to be torn down and collecting them, drawing them into his work, gradually writing stories around those buildings, and then finally rebuilding the buildings or imaginary versions of them out of cardboard. And now his cardboard building collection finds its way into art museums. It's become a kind of sculptural entry into the art gallery world for Seth. So he's a collector who's also creating. And in some ways, he's a creator who creates what he collects. So there's a kind of fluidity between knowing about mid-century modern, building stuff in mid-century modern, and that becomes a springboard for the next sets of stories that Seth is going to tell during his novels. And mid-century modern is anti-stuff. It is. So it's really paradoxical that mid-century modern has become stuff that people hold on to. The digital becomes this gathering point of this. So this series, The Hip Hop Family Tree, is about the year-by-year -year history of hip hop. And a variety of people online have now done their own playlist of the songs referenced in this comic. So the comic inspires media collectors to reassemble the pieces. And the same thing I'm discovering this week is going around Kim Deitch, who's really into swing music and crooners and so forth, that his stuff is now the songs he writes about find their way and get assembled online. We can think of steampunk as an example of a collector culture that becomes a creator culture. Right? So it's about building futuristic material objects that have the aesthetic of the Victorian era. Uh, and many people have talked about that as an implicit critique of the plastic and metal look of contemporary digital culture, going back to, to marble and to mahogany and brass and so forth, making the object itself something meant to last, something to be a source of pride, so forth. And retrofuturism, which is one of my fixations, is a similar example of that. These are people obsessed with 1930s vintage images of tomorrow, uh, often you know, called yesterday's tomorrows, and particularly those associated with the 39 World's Fair, the world of tomorrow. But we can see a film like Tomorrowland, or a film like Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow, or a graphic novel series like Terminal City, all as representing this attempt to reclaim the material objects of the 39 World's Fair. And if you go online, people have reconstructed building by building the 39 World's Fair, digitally modeling it, making knockoffs of collector's items of the 39 World's Fair. All kinds of things are moving back to material production around the 39 World's Fair. All right. Comics and stuff, then. I'm, this, uh, how do we connect these things together? This is from uh, Daniel uh, Chloe's Ghost World. 
It's the front piece of the book, and I'll say something about the little odd figurine there in, in just a minute. So if we look histor if we so I'm inter I go from that to art. I'm going to play art historian for a moment and paint again with some broad strokes. But people who've written about the emergence of the still life in early modern Europe are very interested in the same question of how did people work through a fundamental shift in material culture and, and the level of representation. So one of the things that's going on is a shift from paintings that are epic in scope, that are themed around you know, larger-than-life protagonists, whether pen, funded by the church as a religious painting or funded by the nation-state as telling of national, nationalism, to a focus on stuff, to the focus on the still life and the abundance. What we know is that Dutch capitalism money is growing really fast. People, there's not a strong tradition of civic outpouring of that money or charity. The Dutch wanted ways to spend their money, and they're fascinated with all the material stuff that's coming into them from the empire around the world. So they have these pictures of plenitude, pictures of beautiful material objects uh, that they painted. These are objects owned by individuals, not by museums or institutions at the time. And they were a way people displayed their own stuff and a way that they developed and showed their appreciation of stuff. Uh, and all kinds of stuff gets collected. And all kinds of images of people collecting and gathering stuff becomes part of it. So what the art historians are telling us about the still life is it's, it's moves from paintings produced for the crown and the church toward paintings produced for private collectors from a focus on epic events to everyday life. And the interesting thing is in that case, the movement from the epic to the everyday was thought of as a lowering of status. In the case of comics, the movement from superheroes to everyday life is seen as raising their status. And it's an interesting paradox to think about why those two things play out differently. But there's a parallel, I think, in that movement that's worth paying attention to. And then there's an appreciation for the texture of the painting as expressing, evoking sensuous relationships and material objects. And that's the discourse around Rembrandt, texture, play of light, the formal qualities of the object being something that's enjoyable in their own right. All right, now let's think about comics and stuff. So this is one of the opening pages from Mysterio Polyp, David Mazzucchelli's graphic novel. And this is the first introduction we have to his protagonist. And we're invited to figure out who this guy is from this panel that shows the state of his living quarters. Right? What, are, what do people notice here? It's messy. It's messy, right? The windows open to the rain. Windows are open to the rain. There's pile, the leaves are falling off the plants. Uh, but the modernist furniture, right? So that tension Glenn's talking about between modern or mid-century modern as being about anti-stuff, and it's piled high with stuff. And that's a contradiction we're going to want to try to understand as we read this book. The next scene, this whole apartment burns up, right? But note that this is the same composition as before. The, the top bottom switches, but the same size panel occurs. Across the book, we get six panels of the size of that same shape, shot, sort of framed in the same way, which take us through the history of a relationship. So this is the pre-beginning of the relationship. He's invited the Grumman over for the first time. He's a good modernist, no clutter whatsoever, nothing organic either, no plants. No, you know, it is just purely the modern furniture design. This is her moving in, and there's this moment of crisis. Will her stuff fit? in his apartment, and there's a fixation on this Japanese chest that represents her cultural ancestry and how that Japanese chest is going to relate to the other material objects. As we go along, we see the space is now half hers and half his. So we've seen that they've integrated the furnishing, including her chest, into the space, and we see these kind of the rounded table is not the same angularity as the, the chairs. We see she's begun to introduce plants in there. And so we can now begin to watch her take over the tensions of the relationship. Uh, and I guess that's the last one that I have. So what's interesting is these are at once still lives. Note that her chest, her precious chest, remains behind after she's deserted him. So that's a kind of interesting telling gesture you only really can make sense of flipping back and forth across these things. So you're scanning this image and flipping back and forth through the book as you read in something I've compared to the breakfast table scene in Citizen Kane, where you encapsulate an entire relationship over a series of emblematic moments. Um, but we learn to read this 
the other thing is that it's both a still life and it is also has narrative in it, right? So many of the classic writing about still life says still life is about the world out without events. This doesn't turn out to be true, and I'll show you in a minute why it's not true, that almost all still lives introduce time back in. But there is a sense that we tend to read the still life as a set of objects in a timeless state, and we read the comic panel as the beginning of some sort of narrative sequence. But that's interesting to think about. The book also encourages us then to think about Polyp in relation to other people in his life. So this is a different artist that he, he has a, and visits his studio, and this guy likes the clutter. This is Polyp's family house, and we can sort of think, what is he rebelling against? How is he asserting his identity differently than his parents? This is the, the fiance's studio, and we see her aesthetic as contrasting with his, what it is that her sensibility is. So we build up over the cross of the book through these panels a picture of these people through their stuff. We're relying on their social knowledge, our social knowledge to make sense of the stuff that they've gathered around them. So here's an example of um, the ways that narrative reasserts itself here. So you may not even notice the cat at first stealing the food, but their the introduction of animals into still life was one of a number of ways. The other is things splitting open, juice pouring out, signs of decay. There are a variety of ways of temporal markers that the still life paintings are involved with. They're simply, so that even the still life, which is a single image, actually begins to imply a sequence of events over time. Something that means that I think there is some value in, in looking at comics and still lifes together. Here's another Kim Deesh. Here we have frontality. He's presenting his collection to us. He's narrating his collection. He's captioning his, his, the objects of that collection. There's a kind of dialogue between the collector and the object that runs through Deesh's work. And it owns, it owns something, I'd argue, to another genre of early modern painting. This is called the Cabinet D'Amateur, where artists created imaginary collections. In almost every case, these are aspirational collections. These are not paintings that were ever found together in the same collection. The collectors and their friends pose with the objects they would like to own. There's a kind of virtuosity of the painter trying to duplicate all of these different painters. There's a virtuosity of the collector who theoretically knows who these painters are, what the original is, where it's located. So it's a bid to expertise around the picture. It's very much part of what someone like Kim Deich is trying to do. And so Deich will beautifully reproduce film stills, classic film stills, uh, and in great detail in his comics, demonstrating that his, while his style is sometimes called wooden or simplistic, and his general style, he in fact has the technical chops to reproduce something in fairly photo accurate detail, and he has the knowledge of the collector. He expects us to recognize that. He's appealing to his habits, the different film grades, how you acquire things, and so forth, becomes shared knowledge in Deich's work. Keep in mind that everything that's drawn in that panel was drawn by the artist at some personal cost, right? There's nothing, they don't get paid any differently if they have a lot of detail in a panel or very little detail in a panel. So there's a kind of professional pride in bringing this stuff in as a display of their skill, a display of their knowledge. In this case, we have Brian Talbot from Grant Granville, and he was very fascinated with Victorian objects of one sort or another. So this idea of bringing this stuff in means that it's something that's hard, difficult to achieve and has to be part of what the story is telling us or what the meaning of the story is going to be. The, the, uh, Talbot also, in his book, Alice in Sunderland, has what he calls a uh, cabinet of curiosity, right? And this is a collection of objects, each one of a kind, not a collection in a traditional sense. There's no series or pattern here. It's a lot of odd, one-of-a-kind objects. But it, the notion of calling it a cabinet of curiosity brings us back to, again, an early modern practice, the collection of lots of odd and interesting things in, in cabinets for display that are meant to be cornucopias of contemporary culture meant to be objects of fragmented curiosity, dispersed attention. And so there's a way of reading what Talbot does in Alice in Sunderland as a, a kind of exploration of all of British history through objects, places, stories that he's bringing together. He creates a collage of stories and story objects. Seth is much more interested in what I call collecting stories, right? Stories of collectors, the ethics of collecting, how people live in relation to their collecting. 
here he's making love with this girl he's just met and he's automatically moved from sex to showing him his collection and getting her ideas about how he can find more. Um, here we see another, the character of Clyde Fans uses his collection of old postcards as a way of building a distance from himself and his overbearing brother and there's a kind of family tension that gets built across this book over collecting his postcards versus his brother's invoices. Uh, this is a sort of fantasy world versus the material world that plays out there. Wimbledon Green, we have the, the whole novel that is about collectors. It's kind of larger than life story that Seth tells about collecting. And in Seth's own autobiography, his autobiographical comics, he also works through his conflicted relationship to stuff. So in one panel, he tells us these stuffed toys, he remembers their faces far better than his classmates or his teachers today. On the other hand, he then recounts the story, but in adolescence, he grabs them all from the attic one day on a lark, throws them, hangs them from trees and shoots the stuffing out of them with a pellet gun. And he sees that as the moment of moving from childhood to adulthood. So this de-romanticization of stuff, how we get rid of stuff is something that he's interested in telling. I showed Ghost World before. Part of what it's, Ghost World's first line is why do you even own this? Right? It's very much about how these two adolescent girls are defining themselves by what they own, what they buy, what brands they acquire, what they make fun of, where they shop. But in the midst of it, there are two really poignant moments, both private moments. The first is one where uh, the protagonist has been looking and trying to get her access to a children's record that she remembers from childhood. Her father overhears her, brings it down from the attic, puts the record out, and she breaks down in tears after a, a, a painful sexual encounter. She just weeps over this old children's record. So we're seeing within the child, behind the cynical adolescent, we're seeing the father-daughter relationships that's dismissed everywhere else in the book. We're seeing the father knows things about her, all told through stuff. The other is similarly, she abandons uh, some stuff of her own at a family a garage sale to go off with her friend, and then she comes at the end of the scene racing back to pick up this little figurine that I pointed out earlier, uh, desperate for the, and relieved that it's there. And again, we see her weep over recovering this. So we're, there's something about the stuff that shows us aspects of her character that are not acknowledged anywhere else in the graphic novel, but they become the turning points for choices that she makes throughout the rest of the book. Finally, those are all works by men. As we turn toward female comic artists, what we see is a very curious pattern where it's less about collecting stuff and more about getting rid of stuff. More about the K of stuff, the clash of family, the stuff that's important there is stuff that's handed down from one generation to the next. Here we see Alison Bechdel's Fun Home, which is all about the father's obsession with antique collecting and so forth, and the tension she faces with her father's aesthetics which she thinks hides things as a facade, and it turns out it is, because he's, what kind of man in 1950s is interested in interior decorating? You guessed it, he's gay, right? And the, the point of the story becomes uh, about the hidden life behind the, sur that was hiding in plain sight through these objects, and then the mother's willingness to get rid of all the things that belonged to the father after his death, and her desire to make sense of the father through his things, all central to the story of Fun Home. Special Exits, uh, Joyce Farmer's book that some of us are going to read for our book club next month. Similarly, about someone, the death of parents, getting rid of clutter, what's left behind. This scene I particularly found poignant, a blind, her blind mother-in-law is saying, asking her if there's still ink smudges in the door frame of their the living room. The father likes to read the newspaper and then stand in the, living, in the doorway talking to her. And so she spent her life cleaning the door frame and she still knows the imprint of him even though she can't see it is still there. So the stain or removal of stain becomes a way of expressing something of the relations within the family. Here we see things falling apart, deteriorating, kid picking away at the, the plaster in an apartment. This is in Mary and Brian Talbot's Daughter in My Father's Eyes, which is her, her autobiography illustrated by Brian Talbot. So she's a feminist writer, an academic who told her own story, and then her husband, the comic artist, illustrates it. But in that moment, then we pick up on the sense of stuff as something we have to clean. Someone has to take care of stuff. Here's Rod Chaste uh, 
can't we talk about something more pleasant, which talks about grime as opposed to dust, which is the central light motif of the collector stories. Grime becomes really important for thinking about these women. She inventories and has photographs in the graphic novel of things left behind after her parents' death, as well as inventorying what she kept and what she got rid of. Finally, see Tyler did a series of books called You'll Never Know, which uses the metaphor of the scrapbook as telling family history. And it's all about her father and mother who were World War II vets, the father's metaphors of army surplus run through the story, and the mother has a different story to tell. The father is the one telling the story. It's his account. She's interviewing him about his military experiences. We get things like this collage of old medals and so forth assembled. The mother's account has to be, comes out at other moments. And we discover that she's lost a child, and child and, and, and his, in his infancy, she's never spoken to her other daughter about. And the daughter brings down a box, and it's full of cards, birth announcement cards. Uh, and the mother breaks down and finally reveals the secret because of response to these material objects. The father is shown in his work, his garage working, doing woodwork. The cover of the book is made out of wood that the father cut, or a reproduction of wood that the father cut. So again, the scrapbook montage metaphor is really important here. Here's her trading off his father, the father showing off the father's jacket at an army surplus store, and she's personalized it, put her own patches on it, made it her own. The mother comes through in things like holiday decorations and flower arrangements, right? A different kind of knowledge or kind of way of representing the material world. She doesn't speak very much, but we see her presence again and again in these scenes where we see the artifacts of a kind of 50, 1950s, 1960s female culture, family culture comes through through decorations. So to wrap up, just briefly, these are some of the things I'm trying to pay attention to as I look at these books. That is, mise-en-scene as a site of virtuoso performance, use of social skills and reading stuff as a key to understanding the characters, their lives, collecting stories, stories collectors tell, be told, stories told by, for, and about collectors, but the practices of collecting, stories about culling through stuff, and I'm interested in that gender distinction that crops up as we look at women's stories about stuff and men's stories about stuff, which in some ways uncomfortably follows traditional gendered lines, but in some ways it's very interesting that it follows those gendered lines. And then stuff is a key for thinking about processes of memory, nostalgia, history that run through these books. And I would argue they're not simply evoking a nostalgic feeling in Susan Stewart's sense of reclaiming a world that never quite existed, so much as they're using old things to critique the present to critique configurations of contemporary culture and politics. There's often what, what um, Swetlama Bloom calls a critical nostalgia running through these works that I'm trying to trace through as we think about it. All right, that's it. So that's what I'm working with. Uh, not well organized yet, but I'm interested in your thoughts, questions, so forth. Hmm. Meryl. So, two immediate thoughts. One about, I, I appreciate the, the critical gender analysis throughout, but I'm wondering if sort of a, also a class and like race analysis all the way through is thinking about sort of the accumulation of stuff and the performance of stuff as respectability um, and the politics of that. And so like how that also fits into the later thread, because that makes me have to think of like the networked nature of stuff these days um, and unboxing videos as this other like thread that is the performance of often toys that are comic based um, and it's a way to experience stuff in a sensory way without having to purchase it um, and so to be able to participate yeah. in stuff culture from a distance as well. So those are just two. Yeah, the unboxing video is another great example of the preoccupation we have right now with stuff and material culture and, and I think it is interesting to think about in that regard. The race and class stuff, very important I think. You know, uh, most of the white guy narratives come from a middle class background. Less true for the, uh, the women's narratives, although they range pretty broadly in class. What I didn't talk about at all here is the last chunk of the book, which deals specifically with race. I'm looking at a comic called By You by Michael Love that's about reg regurgitating racist past, how we confront characters like Bear Rabbit and images of Piccaninnies and, 
Aunt, Aunt Jemima and so forth, and ties into a whole emerging literature on, on African American collectors of racist artifacts and how we're processing and working through that material. And it also includes a chapter on comics from India and New Zealand, which are imagining an alternative comics culture where the periphery becomes the center of the comics world, and they often imagine libraries of comics never produced. So both of those are parts of the book. I just haven't done enough work on either of those chapters yet, to even tried to put a couple of slides to talk about it, but it's, it's where the book ends, is finally moving from the American-centric version to something that's looking at race and nationalism, nationality, and in relation to these themes as well. But the question of privilege is there, right? The collect, there's no wonder male create comics who have a certain revenue are able, have the privilege of collecting the past, have a relatively unproblematic relationship to the past. Although all of these guys sooner or later acknowledge racism, acknowledge some of the other bad things about the past in their work, they, you know, there's not an attempt to whitewash the past per se, but there is a different attitude toward it. I think crops up and it's also very personalized as opposed to tied to family or other kind of identity groupings. Hmm. Anna. Um, one of the things that's talked about in contemporary art history is this idea of the crisis of connoisseurship. So art historians are not seeking to be trained in the kind of old school necessary historical uh, art historical practices of like authentication and verification and, and being able to determine the provenance of an object. And the critique is that they're instead being trained in kind of critical theory and, um, and other modes that don't uh, lend itself to the traditional curatorial practices of a, of a museum. And so one of the things that is missing from the art historical conversation is the way that connoisseurship and the skills of connoisseurship are being produced um, by amateur, collector, and the kinds of communities you think about. So I'm curious if you have a sense of how your work um, on stuff and like examining the status of stuff through comics speaks to larger questions in the sociology of knowledge and the status of the university. <laughs> well, that's that's not that's that's not a small question. You know, I mean, I, as as you can, you know, to some degree, this is my book on collecting and curate, curate curation in a way, that this is how it fits in the larger body of work, that I've done a lot of work on fans and creation of alternative forms of culture, alternative forms of knowledge, and looking at collective intelligence in, uh, the, in convergence culture, different systems of distribution in the case of spreadable media. This is, a, this is very much about knowledge, management of history, curatorship, and trying to reclaim the collector. I mean, and in that sense, I think it will speak ultimately to the sociology of knowledge. It's not necessarily the central place that I'm starting to think about this through, but I'm hoping it will speak to a number of fields that are interested in how we organize the past in relation to non-expert knowledge or non-authorized expert knowledge, so forth. And in some degree, the collector has been, in fan studies, the, the most reviled figure. Right, there's a tradition of on collecting studies which looks at it as capitalism run wild. Right, it's all about fetishing the fetishizing objects. It's also there's a kind of psychoanalytic notion of collecting that people have written about. You know, it's the part I bracketed when I did textual poachers years ago, and I was sort of dismissing the focus on the collectible as part of fan. There's now a turn toward material history in fandom studies that a number of writers have been trying to pursue, and this is me trying to find my way back into that tent and thinking about it in new ways. So being someone who's interested in grassroots knowledge and creativity, I'm definitely interested in what this kind of counter history or alternative accounts of things look like. Uh, in some cases, you know, the knowledge passed from one collector to another is, it's often much more important for these artists and how they depict the past than anything they're getting out of academic works. Um, so yeah, I think I think you're you're onto something big. What it means for the future of the university, who knows? Hmm. Yeah. Great. So I was wondering about the relationship with the cabinet of curiosities and how that sort of. I feel like when you show the picture of the sort of mid mid twentieth century American home, and it echoes to the cabinet of curiosities and 
I don't know. I feel like from that we get the museum, and so it's that impulse for collecting gets institutionalized and sort of like becomes this thing about heritage. In a way, what you're exploring is it's not an echoing of that. It's, it's like a resurgence of that because now it's the middle class that had access to all of, all of these things. I just was wondering if, in a way, sort of that narrative was already played out at a more sort of like a smaller level, and do you make any sort of parallel with that, that we're in the middle of something that already happened at a different level? Yeah, that's, that's, it's interesting. I mean, most of the writing about cabinets of curiosity assumes that, in fact, those curiosities, which are sort of grab bags of objects people succeeded in, in bringing together, gave way to a much more linear display of knowledge and information in the museum. What often gets left out of that account is the dime museum, which is an incredibly cluttered space that the early museums were full of miscellaneous stuff. Um, so Deitch, who does, did those pictures of his wife's cat collection, has lots of images of dime museums running through his work because he's fascinated with 19th century, early 20th century forms of popular culture. And so I think for him, the connection to the dime between collectors and particularly the sense of the, the random collecting behavior. He, w he uses the term in some of his interviews, accumulators as opposed to collectors. Accumulates meaningful objects, but they don't organize into a structured pattern like the cl classic notion of a collector where things are part of a series or part of a, a, a whole. The individual objects are what one pays attention to. And in that sense, the home now may look more like a dime museum or a cabinet of curiosity. We may be back there. But there's also that possibility of systematic curation. So Seth, for example, is all about going to garage sales and having to find. And he's dismissive of the digital as destroying the pleasures of collecting because it's too easy, it's too organized, it's too structured. Whereas for Deesh, the idea of going on, eBay becomes this magic device where his stories go along, he just goes to eBay, finds the material he wants and pushes the storytelling forward as he acquires just in time the objects he needs to tell a story. So in that sense, collecting can be much more systematic, much more structured in the age of eBay and the age of Google than it would have been previously. And so again, this tension between accumulators Porters, collectors, and minimalists, all representing different ways, we, different ethics, different aesthetics we have of organizing the material world around us. And some of that does look very much like a return to the Dime Museum. Yes? So, uh, really great stuff, Henry. And I, I'm wondering about value in all of this, too, and, and how, and maybe it's, it's too big a question, but the, you mentioned that part of collecting can have this speculative aspect, like what something <clears throat> will be worth in the future, yes. but then there's this nostalgic aspect as well, and, and how personal that can be, and I, I'm wondering, you know, how, you, I mean, maybe there's so many varieties of this, or are there a few ways these break down when you think about the value of the stuff? Yeah, I mean, I, I, so on the one hand, yes, I think most of the collectors, of which I'm probably among, I mean, somewhere between a collector and hoarder myself, I'm not sure where I fall on that continuum, but the collectors tend to look down on speculators as heartless, right? And if you look at something like, is it Toy Story 2 that has the collector in it, mm -hmm. that keeps the toy that we've anthropomorphized inside a box and doesn't even let, it doesn't really let it breathe or have an active life, the sense of putting your comics in the bag the minute you get them and not even reading them, that the material objects takes precedent over the content of the comics, is there's been a set of tensions all along between collectors for whom this is living culture that we want to embrace and engage with and holding on. And that panel I showed from Joe Matz spent has him anguishing over every time he touches the comic, he damages it. So how does he hold on to this valuable thing even as he wants to read it? That, frack, that tension is, I think, very real, very much there. So then the second part becomes value as in what's valuable is, is there a tension between culturally valuable materials and economically valuable materials? Is there a tension, or are we revaluing things economically because of their sentimental value? That's what a lot of people said about eBay, that it's, it's not at all about use value or material value of the objects. It's very much about the sentimental and collective symbolic value of the objects that takes over at a certain point. It's a market driven almost entirely by sentiment in that regard. That's a really interesting thing. 
and fits into this larger pattern of the collection being democratized, both in terms of who collects, which goes to Merrill's class question, and in terms of what gets collected, things that don't carry high prestige being worth collecting is very much part of the shifts that we're describing. So all that's bound up together. It's why this book is hard for me to get started on is there's so many things that all have to be said at once and all have to be said first before you get to the next level. It's a, I'm still working through the what of things that the book is trying to deal with, but the questions to me are really interesting at this point.